Grace to you and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to the 111th Sprunt Lectures. It's hard for me to believe that it's been three years since the last time we were able to gather for these lectures, and we're so glad to have you back. As I am speaking, the alumni associate, Nicole Smith, is handing out a handout for you, which will be pertinent to tonight's lecture. If you have not received a copy of that or of the bulletin for tonight, you are welcome to raise your hand and let us know, and we'll be certain that you get that. Just a few announcements to make before we begin. You're invited, of course, to all of the activities scheduled for this night and in the coming day. After tonight's lecture, you're invited to join us for an evening concert with Adrian Williams here in Watts Chapel. That will begin around 7.30. The concert with a gifted musician, Adrienne, is the daughter of alumna, the Reverend Sandra Caldwell Williams of Charlotte, who is a Mace and MDiv graduate in the class of 2006. And Adrian was a daughter of this community during her formative years. So you won't want to miss tonight's concert at 7.30. The registration desk will reopen tomorrow at 7.45 in front of Holderness Dining Room. That's Richmond Hall. And for some of us who were students here back in the day, the Belk Center. But anyway, Richmond Hall and Holderness Dining Room. We will also host a breakfast conversation with Professor Melanie Jones, and that's to begin in the morning at 8 o'clock. Food will be served, so please come and join us just prior to 8 o'clock, and, and Professor Jones will lead us in that conversation. Copies of Dr. Will Gaffney's books are available for purchase tomorrow, along with those of Dr. Kimberly Russell. A book signing opportunity will occur tomorrow evening here in Watts Hall after the third lecture. We will reconvene here in Watts Chapel tomorrow at 9 a.m. for Dr. Will Gaffney's second lecture in the series on Translation Matters, Who Translates God Words and How. A special reception will occur on Wednesday morning at 1030 to honor our 2022 distinguished alum, Mary Jane Winter, and our 2022 Black Alumni Association trailblazer, Cheryl Blow McDowney. There will be an opportunity for question and answer with our Sprunt lecturer, Dr. Gaffney, during our conversation with her hosted by Dr. Sam Adams on Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock here in Watts Chapel. Please note the change in location. It will not be in Lake Chapel, but it will be here in Watts Chapel so that we may live stream. To assist in transportation on campus this evening, all day tomorrow and on Wednesday, we'll gladly offer you a lift in a golf cart located just outside the entrance of Watts Hall. I now call on our president, Dr. Brian Blunt, who will formally welcome you and host tonight's lectures. Dr. Blunt. Thank you, Clay. It is a joy to look out from this pulpit and see your faces. It has been uh, such a wonderful year this year to be able to have students back on the campus and in chapel both here and over in the Early Center Chapel and also down on the Charlotte campus in Chapel. But there's something special about the Sprunt Lectures, to be able to see alumni and friends of the seminary from both campuses and from many decades to be here to celebrate together the work that we do in scholarship, the scholarship that comes to us from persons who are from around our country and our world. And this year we will have a wonderful set of lectures as I will be sharing in the introduction in just a moment. So on behalf of our faculty here at Union Presbyterian Seminary, and when I say here, I mean both in Richmond and in Charlotte, let me welcome you formally, and let me say just how wonderful it is to see your faces this day. Let us begin with 
a moment in song, and I'll ask those who are able if they might stand for our first hymn, number 633. Let us bow our heads. Gracious God, we are thankful to be able to gather this evening, thankful to be able to hear instruction, open our minds and our hearts that we might indeed be able to hear, that what we hear might be transformational for us, that we might be able to see anew, to think in creative ways, and to open ourselves up to challenging opportunities of thought that will thrust us into challenging ways of living and being in our world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. One of my favorite pictures of the Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney is on the Bright Divinity School website. We find her in what appears to be a library setting. On the table before her is a large, rolled open scroll. Though I cannot see the lettering, I presume that the text is in Hebrew. She has a large metal ruler in her hand, pointing to a particular section. On either side of her are students focusing in on where the ruler is directed. And Dr. Gaffney is smiling. The photo represents for me the calling of a scholar teacher, someone who desperately enjoys what she is doing, and perhaps even more so delights in the opportunity to share what she sees with students whom she is mentoring. 
Though I suspect the photographer staged the resulting presentation, it nonetheless captures the likeness of what is genuine and alluring about biblical scholarship and teaching. The students are not smiling. <laughs> as students often are not when they are engaged in deep learning. Their expressions in this photo op are intense and focused. Leaning in, they are, I suspect, being drawn into the perspective on life and faith that fosters change and how they previously understood the world and perhaps understood themselves. Encounters, true engaged encounters with ancient texts are like that. And teachers like Dr. Gaffney are celebrated because they are able to make such encounters as irresistible and as compelling as they are exciting. The faculty of Union Presbyterian Seminary has invited the Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney to be our 2022 Sprunt Lecturer precisely because we know that through her teaching, these next three days will be for us such an irresistible, compelling, exciting, transformational learning encounter. We will stand alongside her as she introduces us to some new texts and reconfigures our relationship with other more familiar texts, ancient and contemporary. For the next three days, we are her students, figuratively looking in over her shoulders as she opens us up to new ways of thinking biblically, theologically, socially, and politically. I suspect that by the time she is done, our faces will be drawn into smiles. We don't have to take a test on what she is teaching after all. We just need to take it in, <laughs> learn from it, revel in it, and allow ourselves to be transformed by it. By the time she is finished, I will have in mind a new favorite image of Dr. Gaffney, not in print, but in my mind of the Union Presbyterian Seminary community leaning in with Dr. Gaffney, drawn into biblical and theological exploration that resets and reframes our intellectual and faith horizons. The Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney, scholar, pastor, preacher, and activist, is the Right Reverend Sam B. Hulsey, professor of Hebrew Bible at Bright Divinity School in Fort Worth, Texas. Dr. Gaffney is a graduate of Earlham College. She received her MDiv with special recognition in homiletics and Hebrew Bible from Howard University School of Divinity. The rest, the rest, <laughs> did I miss something? The recipient of a graduate certificate in women's studies from Duke University, she also received her PhD in Hebrew Bible from Duke University. A former chaplain in the U.S. Army Reserve, she served as pastor of the Thompson Chapel AME Zion Church before joining the Episcopal Church. As an Episcopal priest, she remains a member of the historic African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas in Philadelphia, the first Episcopal Church in the U.S. founded by and for African Americans. A former member of the Dorsche Direct Reconstructionist Minion of the Germantown Jewish Center in Philadelphia, she remains actively engaged in interreligious work and is particularly interested in how Jews and Christians interpret the texts they hold in common. She is licensed in the dioceses of Pennsylvania and Fort Worth. Dr. Gaffney is a prolific scholar. She is the author of a women's lectionary for the whole church, year A and year W. Womanist Midrash, a reintroduction to the women of the Torah and the throne, a commentary on Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah, Daughters of Miriam, Women Prophets in Ancient Israel, and co-editor of the People's Bible and the People's Companion to the Bible. She has also published a commentary on judges in the CEB Women's Bible, she is currently writing a second volume of Womanist Midrash, which focuses on women and the prophets. She has a multitude of other articles and book chapters on biblical studies, womanist approaches to biblical studies, homiletics and pedagogy, such as intoxicating teaching as transformational pedagogy. 
Dr. Gaffney's sermons have also been widely published in texts such as those preaching women, the audacity of faith, and preaching as resistance. Many of her sermons in both Jewish and Christian congregations can be found posted in her blog, and she has also contributed to the Huffington Post religion dispatches and working preaching. As I noted earlier, Dr. Gaffney is also a teacher. Her course title suggests that she thrives working in the intersection between the ancient biblical text and contemporary circumstances in which people of different faiths find themselves. Courses like Introduction to Interpreting the Hebrew Bible, Advanced Seminars on Exodus and Judges, Womanist Biblical Interpretation, The Bible and Black Lives Matter. Her doctoral seminars attend to translating the text from multiple manuscript traditions, including Masoretic, Septuagint, Qumran, Samaritan, and Targumic with rabbinic commentary. At all levels, she attends to womanist, feminist, post-colonial, and queer commentary. And because of my own interest in zombies and their portrayal <laughs> in popular culture, yes, I can work zombies in even to this, and how that relates to biblical apocalyptic and references to resurrection, I am fascinated with Dr. Gaffney's interest in the ancient Near Eastern and biblical portrayals of Lilith and other night stalking creatures, which led to her participation in two HBO documentaries on the origin and evolution of vampire mythologies. <laughs> Dr. Gaffney will engage and challenge us over these next three days. I am excited for what we will learn and what we will and how what we will learn will impact how we see and understand ourselves and our place in God's world. So fix your eyes on Dr. Gaffney, lean in with her as she engages and focus with her on the material she puts in front of us. Material that operates from the theme translation matters who translates God's words and how. And tonight's lecture, Translation Matters, the invisibility of biblical translation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gaffney. Thank you, Dr. President Blunt, and congratulations on your retirement. Many thanks to the community, uh, particularly the faculty who invited me. Thank all of you who are here tonight for the gracious gift of your time. Thank those of you who are watching and participating online. President Blunt, that photograph that you like so much was indeed staged. However, the original moment was not staged and the students were smiling and <laughs> you might be familiar with this phenomenon. Our advancement and recruitment and publicity folk saw the iPhone photo of the original moment and said, oh, we need to do this again. I also want to give thanks to and for the spirit of Mama Katie, who is here with us and with me today. Translation matters. This week, I am going to provide one set of answers for the question, who translates God words and how? Today we're going to talk about the invisibility of translation, and so I invite you to take up your handout. We're going to look at Psalm 68, verse 11, which in Christian English Bibles is verse 12. And that little fact uh, is our first introduction to how and why translation matters, but we are not going to talk about that. I am giving you a reading assignment, and who knows, there may well be a test. So I invite you to take a moment and read all of those translations of 
that one verse from Psalm 68 you have before you. And for those of you online, the NET, I will skip that one and come back to it. The Wycliffe Bible, uh, medieval Bible, uh, written in medieval English, the Lord shall give, spelled with two Y's, a U and an E, uh, we don't have time to take up that, to him, H-E-M, that preaching the gospel with much virtue. The Geneva Bible, the Lord gave matter to the women to tell of the great army, the Bishop Bible, uh, uh, Recon Reformation era, the Lord gave the word. Great was the company of the preachers. King James, the Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. The NRSV, the Lord gives the command. Great is the company of those who bore the tidings. In very fine print at the bottom of an NRSV Bible in about three point font, or the company of women. The, Common English Bible, my Lord gives the command. Many messengers are bringing good news. The Jewish Publication Society, Tanakh, the Lord gives a command. The women who, brings the, who bring the news are a great host. Uh, what my students used to call the RGB, the revised Gaffney Bible, but now finds its life uh, as the women's lectionary. The author of life gave the word. The women who proclaim the good news are a great army. What is happening here? Which is correct? According to whom? By what standards? Anybody have a favorite? I'm still a black church preacher. If you don't talk to me, you are not leaving. <laughs> Uh, for those who are attending online, uh, the voice called out RGB. Anyone have a, another one that strikes them meaningfully? King James. King James. Gaffney. Gaffney. You're too kind. You don't have to do that, but I'll pay you later. <laughs> JPS. Who sets the standards? Who forms the translation committees? Who invites folk onto translation committees? What happens when perhaps first rank or first order scholars are so busy with all of our invitations that we can't attend to those committees and someone else takes up? Have you considered the text on the page or the digital screen of your Bibles, where it comes from, not out of heaven, out of a committee. And think about all the things you have said about committees on which you have served. <laughs> Is there any love for committees under the heavens. <laughs> Can we, who have been minoritized in and by the scriptures and those who translate them, can we trust them? Can we trust them in translation? Can we trust those who translate for us and tell us that if I had given you another sheet with a line of translation of the Song of Songs, verse one and five, would have told us that you are dark but lovely. You are lovely in spite of being dark and black because you can't be black and beautiful. That did not exist in biblical translation until the year of Our Lady and non-binary celestial beings, 1,800, 1989, I couldn't do that in my head. 1989, 
the NRSV translated black and beautiful. That lie was in the scriptures, in the hands of English readers, for over a millennium and a half. Translation matters because it is the only means that people who cannot read biblical languages have to access the scriptures about which they make theological claims such as this is the word of God. Yet the act of translation and the principles that govern it are frequently invisible to many readers save for preference, we just took a preference poll, Preferences based on things like how it sounds, what's familiar, how much it agrees with an idea you already have about God and scripture, or the belief that only one translation of the Bible is right and indeed fell straight from heaven. In Womanist Midrash, when I was writing it, I wrote a translator's preface, which my publisher then told me would terrify people because it was translation theory, and they moved it to the back as an appendix so those folk who really wanted it would go and read it anyway. But I was modeling my translator's preface on scholarly Bibles like the NRSV in which there is a to the reader section. I have tried to get my students to read that. Uh, I have failed. <laughs> it was important for me to explain to my readers what my translation practices were for the very same reason that minoritized scholars disclose our identities and cultures and the constituent elements of our beings that we bring into our work because we bring them into our work like everyone else, including the mainstream white scholars who don't disclose their identities and presume that their readings are neutral when in fact they are emerging from whiteness and heteropatriarchy and cis patriarchy. So I disclosed what I do, which meant that I had to think about what I do and articulate it to myself. And for me, translation is art and science. The science part is obvious from the field of translation and linguistic studies. It is grammatical and taxonomic and syntactical and philological and lexical and euphemistic and more than occasionally idiosyncratic. The art, though, is what I and good translators bring to the work. Translators like Everett Fox, uh, translators like uh, Rabbi Marsha Falk. Uh, it was Marsha Falk who helped me understand that Song of Songs uh, verse, uh, chapter one, verse five, what it meant that this woman was uh, dark as Solomon's tent curtains. Rabbi Falk translates that as, uh, as goat hair tents, as uh, dark as tents made from the hair of Kadari goats. And Kadari goats were, had luxurious fur, think cashmere, and they were midnight rippling soft silky black. And so when I began to teach that, I would use pictures of uh, uh, models like uh, Niam Gatwick, who uh, is so black she is almost blue. And so I would use her to illustrate that text. So the artistry of bringing out not only the idea, but putting it in beautiful language. And so I attend to the technical matters, but the artistry, and for me, as I was having the discussion with Dr. Rossa in the car that it's essential that it be uh, orally and orally pleasing. 
So when Miriam is struck with a skin disease, and she is not, in spite of bad translation and exegesis, turned white for her critique of Moses' black wife, because they were all Afro-Asiatic, and white is nowhere in the text, but when she was struck with a skin disease, and Aaron says, please, Lord, heal her, is what you get in the NRSV, the Hebrew is, listen for what repeats, El nah, Rafa nah, la. And somebody translated, please, Lord, heal her. Technically correct, but I translate, hear, holy one, hear and heal her. Reproducing the assonance. That's the, the artistry that goes into translation. And so I describe the work of translation as poesis, using, uh, the Latin word creation to create that comes from the Greek verb poin, which means to make. And so in the Latin sense, it means to create poetry. But the poesis root is also used in biomedical stuff. My degree from Earlham uh, was in biology, and I was a research biologist for some period of time, and my first peer-reviewed publication was a jointly authored piece in the Journal of Hematology. Creating blood cells is called hematopoiesis. And so translation is like creating poetry on the artistic side, and creating blood cells in your body on the science side. When your body creates blood cells, it doesn't create them out of nothing. It is not ex nihilo. They are created out of the stuff of humanness, right? So when I create or craft a translation, it is not out of nothingness. It is out of the stuff and stuffs of the text. The literary stuff, the cultural stuff, but all of the text, not just the text that's being translated, the text that is the world in which the text is being translated, the text that is the translator. And that is why translation is contextual. So the way that I translate in the lectionary is not the way that I translated in Daughters of Miriam, but there is a through line because there is evolution in my scholarship and thinking about <coughs> translation. Translation was taught to me as a person educated in the white supremacist religious guild with its roots in the enlightenment with its, which gave birth to Nazism in which you could find many of the founding fathers of biblical and religious studies. That whole project taught me that translation was good and neutral and disinterested, but interpretation was encultured and interested and biased. And they were wrong. <laughs> there is no neutrality because all of our work is done by people who have all the feels. Even when they don't know what their feels are or how their feels are affecting the work they do. That conversation reminds me of the anti-intellectual conversation in the black church where when educated preachers like Dr. Jones are invited and they'll say, she's got all those degrees but they don't matter. What really matters is she got Jesus, yeah. right? that sanctification and edumacation are posited as being on, not only on a continuum or a binary continuum, but on a, an anti-magnetic continuum where they push against each other. But sanctification requires being in your right mind, having the mind of Christ and knowing that wisdom is only, that fear of the Holy One is only the beginning of wisdom. There's a whole lot on the other side. And so this idea, this Western 
Gentilic, Christian or Christian adjacent idea is set up in opposition to uh, early Jewish critical scholarship. It often disregards the rabbinic period. When I was in Duke, I did a master's in rabbinic studies and like many poor graduate students, I didn't collect the certificate, so I don't have any paper on that. But what I have is my training in that field and some publications in that field as well. And so the, the earliest scholarly work on the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, is the Targum. And the Targum is in Aramaic. It includes the translation of the text with interpretation in the verses. So not Bible and commentary, but Bible and commentary. And that, link, that word targum uh, comes from the Aramaic word for translate. And where the scriptures are in Aramaic, uh, the Peshitta, which is the scriptures of the Syriac Orthodox Church, in those scriptures, in a scene like in Ezra at the water gate, where uh, it's the only place in the Bible that you actually find a, a podium, uh, you know, Ezra reads the Torah and he has these elders with him and they make the text known to the people. They uh, translate the Hebrew into Aramaic because the folk have been uh, exiled and under occupation and no longer speak Hebrew. And then they go through the community to help the people understand, to give the sense. So they do a little teaching after the translating. So they do translating, they do interpreting, and then they do teaching. And so uh, this word uh, targum and nouns related to it, like metaturgamin, the person who does this work, are there in the scripture. And in the places in the New Testament where something is said in Aramaic and it's translated and somebody says this means. So that idea has footprints uh, in uh, both testaments of scripture. And so as I looked at how this category functioned, I thought it made sense with reference to the way preaching is understood in the black church. And that is that the preacher translates the word of God for the people. That as powerful as the scripture is, the reading is not enough. The preacher must say something about the word and craft it, translate it into a word that is fit for the congregation and the moment. And so that work of being a translator prophet, even in a context where a preacher is not actually doing linguistic translation, they're doing cultural and narrative translation. That role, the metaturgamen, the interpreter and translator of the divine, that categorizes black preaching in my experience and my preaching as I attempt it. So thus it is, that wrapped in the mantle of the translator prophet, I aim to make visible biblical translations according to the womanist axiom, making it plain, which is why womanist midrash in includes that translator's preface turned appendix. You will find much of what I have said here tonight in that appendix, but in a different sequence, because in order to make the word fit for the moment and the congregation, I remixed it, right? So I took this notion of the translator prophet and my understanding of black preaching, particularly the sanctified imagination where black folk do what I understand to be a form of indigenous midrash where the preacher, even in a context where a preacher might believe that the thing fell out of heaven and is unadulterated and inerrant and all of those other words, 
will yet and still tell a story about the text that is not in the text to help people understand. And when the preacher prefaces it by, in my sanctified imagination, it gives, it lets the congregation know that they are trustworthy, that they're not saying in this part is in there. And so then the congregation will trust them and go, as the people say, a little way down the road with them to see where they're going with that and know it will be okay. So translation, interpretation, sanctified imagination. I put those things together and translated passages of text, did the deep exegetical work, and then crafted womanist midrash, sanctified imagination through womanist biblical scholarship. And here is a piece about Ahinoam, who you might know as the wife of Saul, but you should know her by her own name. And uh, her daughters, Merav and Michal. This passage is set after David has abandoned Michal. She had been taken uh, from him at one point, given to someone who loved her, but then David took her back and her husband followed him, crying on the road, her husband Palti. David took her back, isolated her, put her in a living widowhood. This is also after David conspired with the Gibeonites to kill the remnant of Saul's seed. So he killed Merib's children, had all five of her sons lynched. This story is set imagining these broken women and their mother trying to comfort them. Michal sobs inconsolably. Only tears have bathed her face in recent days. Her hair hasn't been oiled or twisted. Such sleep as she has had has been from exhaustion, fitful, fleeting. At other times, she falls deathly silent, staring at something no one can see. Then she talks to herself or someone else. The servants make the sign of the evil eye behind her back. They say she is mad as her father, that David is better off without her. The only one who can calm her, feed her, bathe her, hold her, is her mother. There are no I told you so's, even though she did tell her that something about that boy just wasn't right. Hush, baby, mama's here. Her arthritis swollen fingers untangling the tightly wound coils of her daughter's hair as she had when she was a child cradled between her thighs. How she wished she were as active as she was then. She'd had to cross her ankles around her to hold her still to finish her hair, her beautiful hair. She had been tearing it out since they had taken her scissors and knives after she had cut it and more that last time. Best not think about that. Having soothed Michael, Ahinoam goes to Merov's room she had come home to Mama after David had manipulated the Gibeonites into killing her babies, all of them. Merov couldn't stay in that house after that. Her husband used to come regularly, coaxing her to return, but we haven't seen him around here in a while now. Merov is on the terrace, pulling up flowers and weeds together, tearing at their leaves and petals and flinging them as far away as she can. Ahinoam sits wincing, and waits. She aches to take her firstborn in her arms, but this child of hers can no longer stand to be touched and will not even meet her eyes. So she waits, wondering who will mother these daughters that David has broken after her death. Because biblical Hebrew is a gendered language, translation of the scriptures 
has feminist and womanist and masculinist and androcentric implications. There is a high degree of correlation between grammatical and biological gender, but there is also the question of ontological gender, the gender of God. Grammatical gender is binary in Hebrew. Virtually every part of speech has one of two genders, masculine and feminine. And it is important to keep those categories separate from categories like female and male and women and men. This is why I just wince when I hear uh, God is a woman. God is not a human being, right? God may be feminine. God may be female. God is not a woman. Those are different categories. And in biblical Hebrew, Hebrew there is a collective category that has been taught forever by the male stream side of the house as masculine plural. It can include an all male group, 100 male people, a mixed gender group, 50 and 50, 99 women and one men, and also it can be used for a female only group, which is what Naomi does when she uses the so-called masculine plural to address Ruth and Orpah, who uh, we know are both women and the only people in her conversation. That's a lot like uh, the use of the term guy, which is masculine, uh, but if I said, Dr. Jones, Dr. Rosaw, you guys, would you meet me after service? Uh, I would be using language that was initially coded as masculine, but now lives beyond that category. So I uh, teach that category as common plural because that's how it functions. And however you name it, what it means is that the expression B'nai Yisrael can be translated as sons of Israel, children of Israel, Israelites, and women, children, and men of Israel. The degree of inclusivity lies solely in the hands of the translator. So, translation matters. Who translates God words matter. That will shape what you hear and thus what you think about God. We have been having conversations in the church for a long time about how to name God, how to talk about God religiously. And the question has been raised, and in some places it's not a question, an assertion is made, but that doesn't happen in the Bible. So too bad we're just stuck with the patriarchy, right? <laughs> But masculine language is not the only language used for the divine in the scriptures. The spirit of God is feminine in form and function, taking feminine verbs exclusively. When beginning, he, God, created the heavens and the earth. And the spirit of God, she fluttered over the face of the earth. They only had to go to Genesis 1-2. <laughs> but they read it in translation by men who chose not to ever use the correct pronoun. In Womanist Midrash, I translate, in beginning, he, God, created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and shapeless, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while she, the spirit of God, pulsed over the face of the waters. A young man engaged me on Twitter, and he said, this could possibly be true. I said, yes. Mm -hmm. I said, but this is important. This changes everything. I said, yeah. 
He went away and talked to one of his Bible college professors. Bible college signifies some things. And they explained to him that the Bible is the literal word of God and God is male because it's literally true that God is referred to as male using a masculine language. However, the feminine language of God was figurative. He was satisfied with that and felt better about his world because if he had been misled about that, then what else might not be true? Reading from Womanist Midrash, though the divine is articulated with feminine and masculine gender in the scriptures, in translation and tradition, God became virtually exclusively male the gendering of God's spirit as feminine calls for the feminine pronoun, yet generations of sexist translators have gotten around this by religiously avoiding the pronoun altogether. So in each case, the text will say the spirit verb. No unacceptably feminine pronoun is needed. But she is still there. Imagine hearing the scriptures proclaimed with the gender of God's spirit restored. The spirit, she rested on them in numbers. Then the spirit of God, she wore Gideon like a garment in Judges. The spirit of God, she came upon David in 1 Samuel. The spirit of God, she has made me in Job. This occurs more than 30 times and I provide the references. She, the spirit of God, she who is also God, at the dawn of creation, fluttering over the nest of her creation, at the same time as he, the more familiar expression of divinity, created all. They, two in one, are the first articulations, self-articulations of God in and the God of the scriptures. God is female and male, and when God gets around to creating creatures in a divine image, they will be female and male as God is. Feminine language occurs in the text repeatedly of God. This means that feminists and womanists advocating for inclusive and explicitly feminine God language are not changing but restoring the text and could be considered biblical literalists. I address the issue of non-binary language in the women's lectionary, which we will get to later in the week. There is a wealth of feminine, metaphorical, and descriptive language for God. Much of it centered on birthing and mothering. Deuteronomy 32, 18, you neglected the rock that gave birth to you. You forgot the God who writhed in labor for you. Job 38, 8, now, who enclosed the sea with doors when it gushed forth from the womb? I do change that from the to my. When I settled in the clouds as its garment, it thick darkness as its swaddling band. Job 38, 29. From whose womb did the ice come forth? And who has given birth to the frost of heaven? This text is also useful for a trans reading because the very next line is, and who's the father of the rain? Uh, God holding both of those possibility in the divine body. The only reproductive organ ascribed to God in the biblical text is a womb. Often the love God feels for humanity is expressed as emanating from that womb, rechem, using the verb racham, unfortunately translated by predominantly male translators as compassion. Amending Phyllis Tribble's womb love, I use mother love. Look at how well it fits in this Passage from 1 Kings where two sex workers are contending over the body, the living body, perhaps only for a moment, of the child. Now the woman whose child was alive said to the king, because her mother love for her child burned within her. Your translations are going to say something like her compassion. Because her mother love for her child burned within her, please, my Lord, give her the living child. Certainly do not kill him. The other said, he shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide him. Hear God. Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no mother love for the child of her womb? Translating that as compassion there when the very next word is womb misses what the poet is saying. And I make an argument in uh, Daughters of Miriam that we should consider 
uh, second Isaiah uh, to include uh, women prophets among the poets. Even in these may forget, yet I will not forget you. We make choices, gendered choices, as translators. Choices that reflect our understandings of gender in the world and the world of the text. Currently, the space in which I make my translation choices is a women's lectionary for the whole church, which includes a discussion of the translations in the introduction, translation notes on every set of readings, uh, we'll consider some later, and a abbreviated list of translation um, principles. And I'll, I invite you to turn to the other page of your handout. And I'm going to explain some of the translation choices I make in their rationales. I expand people groups to make the presence of women and girls explicit, like instead of saying Canaanites, I will say the women, children, and men of Canaan. So not Joshua slaughtered the Canaanites, which we were taught to celebrate in Sunday school, but Joshua slaughtered the women, children, and men of Canaan. And that means you're gonna to have to engage their humanity in that story. Um, I list genealogies maternally uh, so David, excuse me, Jesus is the son of Bathsheba. Jesus looks a lot more like Bathsheba. The women that Jesus hangs out look a lot more like Bathsheba. Jesus is not doing son of David things, right? What happens in our preaching when we do that? Because the scriptures use both sets of language, and because the masculine language has been used nearly exclusively, I make an editorial decision to use feminine language exclusively when there is a pronoun in the Psalms. I do this so that women and non-binary folk will hear the scriptures read, and particularly those people who pray the Psalms will hear them in language that is not completely alienating and alter. And so that non-women, uh, non particularly men, will listen to constructions of God with which they do not immediately and automatically identify as a means of course. I uh, use uh, father sparingly, only when it has to do with sonship or Jesus' particular uh, parroting. But for example, when I translate uh, the look at the lilies of the field, consider the sparrows, they neither toil nor reap, they have all their need. Uh, so your heavenly provider uh, is the term I use there. Um, I have a, in that appendix, I have a list of God names and we'll talk about uh, some of those. Some of those names include th like things from my culture like the Ark of Safety from uh, Rastafari, I use Dread God uh, from Dr. Joel Rosenberg, the fount of life, the womb of life, the wisdom of the ages, she who is majesty. All of those become names uh, for rendering the divine name yud heh vav -Hey, which we do not uh, spell out and insert vowels in and which we certainly do not say. Uh, I use Judeans preferentially to Jews, but not to the point of eradicating Jews and Judaism, the concern that uh, A.J. Levine raised recently, so I'll use Judeans when it's clearly geographical or political. Uh, and because in this world, blackness has been identified with, with evil and badness and not capable of beauty, I use uh, shadow and bleakness and gloom when dark and black are being set up in a good, bad, binary. Translation matters. Gender matters. Gender matters to the readers and hearers of the scriptures who are privileged to share the dominant portrayal of God, the majority of biblical characters, the majority of biblical characters who have speaking parts, the majority of translators of biblical texts, and the majority of interpreters of the text. 
Gender matters in the text, in the world, in the world of the text, and in the world of the translator. Gender matters to me in countless numbers of women hearers and readers of the biblical text for whom it is scripture. Gender matters significantly to those who have been and are marginalized because of gender, especially when it is done in the name of God, appealing to the scriptures. Gender matters. Translation matters. And as for me, Job 33, 4, the spirit of God she has made me and the breath of the mothering God, Shaddai the breasted one, gives me life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gaffney, for that. I guess I, the word that came to my mind at first was that troubling lecture, troubling in a good way, to help us rethink and refocus as we think about translation, interpretation, sanctified imagination, especially as we think about how we translate and almost the way in which you play on the sense of the more often literal one can be, the more challenging the translation becomes and how frightening that can be. Yeah, that's um, it's a potent point uh, to recall. Um, translation matters. We got a sense of how much it does. I hope you will attend with me tomorrow because you will be lecturing two more times and then we'll have opportunity on Wednesday morning to be in conversation with her, to ask her some questions about some of the things that she's been talking about, to have a dialogue. Uh, to hear her dialogue with one of our faculty members, Dr. Adams. Uh, so it'll be um, fascinating, so hold your questions, um, write them down, make note of them, uh, so that uh, we'll have opportunity as we share together on Wednesday morning and listen to dialogue um, and have time for opportunity for exchange. Um, I also want us to recall that in just a few moments, um, we will have uh, a concert here um, at 7.30. Uh, so I, that promises to be uh, also a wonderful um, moment. So I want you to um, remember that and uh, to, if you go out and have a brief moment of time on the quad, um, come back and uh, have an inspiring moment here as you listen and settle in to some beautiful music. And I also want you to remember that tomorrow morning uh, we will be gathering, uh, Clay, it is at eight o'clock, right? Eight, eight o'clock over in the Holderness dining room. Okay, I'm, I'm, I often remember wrongly, but I'm remembering <laughs> rightly this time. I don't have it in front of me, but that will be um, a conversation. Um, Dr. Melanie Jones will lead us in that. And then we'll be back here um, for the second lecture at uh, 9 a.m. Okay. Let us uh, come to close by standing and our closing hymn uh, this evening, those of us who are able to do so and those who are not able to stand in spirit. The hymn is number 408. There is a sweet, sweet spirit.
August 15th. Oh, is that what? Yes, that's at least last time I heard. That's when the truck arrives.
Thank you, Jesus. She was right here on this campus. And guess what? She sung in the Black Caucus choir. She wasn't the right age. She wasn't even enrolled, but we needed her voice. And you will find out why we needed her voice tonight. But personally, I was really blessed. Plus, I blessed her. I let her comb roll my hair so she could get good and do us. I let her type my papers so she could get good, good and get some money. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But that's how it is. I was able to bless her. And guess what? You know how much it costs to go to cosmetic school. You know how much it costs to go to typing school. I let her do all that. And she learned it for free. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We are blessed to have Adrian here tonight. Her mother could not make it. Sandra was here when I was here, and we had such a good time together. We had every night we cooked together, and Adrian was a recipient of good food. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. But Worth, her father, Worth Williams, is here tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And the last thing I want to say, you are going to hear from Adrian three generations of musicians. She has truly been blessed. Her father, 35 years in the same church. That's God. And we are so blessed to have her here, here tonight. And one of her songs is going to be, Let's Stay Together. Hallelujah. How appropriate that is. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, Adrian, do your thing. <laughs> I, I can live up to such a grandiose introduction. Um, I am Adrian Williams, and thank you, Union PSCE, for having me here with you during your Sprunk lecture series. I'm excited and a little nervous, but it's okay. Um, I have my crew of background singers here. I'm just letting you all know that now you're my background singers and my background dancers, so don't be shy. If the spirit moves you and your hip starts moving in the name of Jesus, you know, do, do, do the Holy Ghost bop, if you will. But we're just going to have a good time. It's all about love. Um, I feel like love, God's love is God's love. It, it, and we just, it doesn't matter how you show it, just spray it love. At the end of the day, by the time we finish singing these songs as a unit, <laughs> We should feel the love, and when we leave out of Watch Chapel, we should spread that same love. And just like the coronavirus, this too, this love thing, it can be a pandemic, it can be contagious. So let's start spreading love, all right? So y'all didn't hear, come here to hear me uh, crack jokes. So if you hear the bass line and you know what it is, clap. Yeah, just enjoy yourselves. This is, this is a family time. I want you to feel like you're in the living room with me. Kick your shoes off, because I'm going to kick mine off. And let's get this party started, all right? When I wake up in the morning up, and the sunlight hurts my eyes, and something without warning up weighs heavy on 
else we got here. I'm like, um, my, I'm not going to say my parents are older, but they're seasoned, very well seasoned. So I grew up hearing all types of music, but deep down inside, I'm always going to be a little soul kid. I love Marvin Gaye. I love, yeah, so let's do a little Marvin Gaye. He's got a really good question. He wants to know what's going on. Bring some understanding here today. 
dedication to Roy Ayers. Um, if you're familiar with him, he's a really cool jazz musician and I really like his swag and his style. So this is my take or my dedication rendition of Everybody Loves the Sunshine. So just, you know, just, just groove with, with me. You know, y'all are some cool cats, so let's just...
So I also like to do mashups. So I'll take maybe the track from one song, sing a totally different song over it. But it works for me, because that's the type of person that I am. So we're going to do a little bit of that. It's a mashup of Lady from D'Angelo. And he loves me from Jill Scott. So yeah, we'll just I want you guys to rock out with me, OK? I think he's been draping on the job. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see what else we have here. I'm 
Just because we disagree doesn't mean it's not all love. So, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. The 
this time we'll take it slow take it slow This ain't a moving on, no fairy tale conclusion, y'all. It gets more confusing every day. Oh, sometimes it's heaven sent, but we head back to hell again. Kissing with makeup on the way. I hang up, you go, rewise, and we fall, and we both feel like walking away. As we take second chances Though it's not a fantasy I still want you to stay Cause we're ordinary people We don't know which way to go Cause we're ordinary people Maybe we should take it slow Take it slow Oh, this time we'll take it slow, take it slow. Oh, this time we'll take it slow. Maybe we'll live and learn. Maybe we'll crash and burn. Maybe we'll stay. Maybe we'll leave. Maybe you'll return. Maybe another fight. Maybe we won't survive Maybe we'll grow, we never know Baby, you and I We're just ordinary people We don't know which way to go Cause we're ordinary people Maybe we should take it slow Take it slow Here's another oldie but goodie remixed. is 
a shining star, my God, and I, my love fantasy. There's not a minute, hour, day, or night that I won't love you. You're at the top of my list, cause I'm always thinking of you. I still remember in the days when I was scared to touch you. How I spent my day dreaming, planning how to say I love you. You must have known that I had deep feelings, deep enough to swim in. That's when you opened up your heart and you told me to come in. Hey, oh, <laughs> a thousand kisses from you is never too much. I just don't want to stop. Hope my This doesn't make you clap. I don't know what will. <laughs> and you have to excuse the, uh, give it up for my band, everybody. Hmm. 
We're going to start that over. Guess who's coming with me? I think we got time for what? Two, two. <laughs> all right, listen, I'm definitely going to need you all help on. <laughs>
like I said, I like Jill Scott a lot. And I think she's awesome. And, yeah. I'm going to attempt to not mangle one of her selections. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I think I will do that. <laughs> so. Anybody 
we're celebrating any anniversaries? Maybe not. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> this song. It's called Anniversary. Um, I just think it's cool and I always liked it so it's all about love, right? I really like this song, so yeah. I like a lot of songs. I'm, I'm sure I've said that. I <laughs> when you grow up in a house um, with a musician, it's hard not to like some type of sounds. So yeah. It's impossible to do that. My dad played forever. 
and ever, and ever, and ever. <laughs> No, but he's an awesome guy, talented musician, and maybe y'all can have him come up here sometime. I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> All right, let's see. That is not what I wanted to do. All right, sorry, you guys. Having some technical difficulties, and the technicality is me, so. Well, maybe we won't be doing that song. Very snowy, how one. 